So today we'll go over the section three of the white paper, how humans change carbon. The previous two sections are um, the overview and the section two videos are up on the website. So if you can go on the web page, you will see the video and also the uh, slide presentation files are also available for you to download. <coughs> so today's section, uh, and then um, next month we'll be talking about sensitivity analysis and then the um, lifestyle carbon dividend in April, and we'll conclude in May. Again, I'm using the same format. So I'll talk about background and context first. And I'll show you why the IPCC's framing is a um, misdirection. So it's basically like a gaslighting that they're doing to us. And then I'll go into some details on Redmond's hypothesis, um, which is the basis of this section in the white paper. Uh, and Redmond's hypothesis has been around since 2003. I think he came up with the hypothesis in 2003. And then uh, we'll examine some of the scientific data, the facts behind uh, what I'm saying in this section. Now the background again, it all begins with this assertion that the American way of life is non-negotiable. And this was an assertion made by President George um, Bush the first, 41st and the 41st president. And uh, he did this right after the Rio summit in 1992 or right during the Rio summit, I think, he made this statement. And it has sort of colored the way we um, arrive at a consensus with the science. And I mean, I really, you know, I'm all for the specification of the American way of life. As an engineer, I look at specification and then implementation. So I'm all for uh, you know, all men are created equal, or all are created equal. Yes, that's the specification. But we, the implementation is we have created the most unequal society in human history. Um, I'm all for, you know, the inalienable right to life, but we have created the greatest killing machine in human history. Uh, if you ask animals, you know, I mean, animals are being killed at the fastest rate ever, and especially in this country, in the U.S., Liberty, we talk about liberty in our documents, in our specification for the American way of life. And, but America is probably the most incarcerated population in human history. Um, and from the pursuit of happiness, we have converted that to the pursuit of pleasure and profit. And we have the most medicated population in human history. I mean, almost half of Americans are taking antidepressants or uh, illegal drugs on a, on a regular basis. So I'm all for Dr. Martin Luther King's dream, but what we really have is the caged migrant kids nightmare. So when specification and implementation don't match, then as an engineer, I can tell you that there is something wrong in our understanding of reality. So when specification is not equal to implementation, this is what Richard Feynman said, then, you know, for a successful technology or civilization, reality must take precedence over public relations because nature cannot be fooled. Nature is just going to blindly give us the karma for our actions. So when we look at the environmental problem and we look at um, all of our environmental issues, there are two major forms of planetary destruction. The first is the killing machine, and it's represented by animal agriculture. And we are killing more animals in four to 12 hours than all the humans that ever died in wars throughout human history put together worldwide. So the killing machine has a huge impact on the environment. And the second is the burning machine, the fossil fuels and in industry. Now, when we look at climate change, the way IPCC has been framing climate change, it's been trying to focus our attention just on the burning machine and, and ignore the killing machine. Why focus on the burning machine? 
because then the American way of life is not the root cause of climate change. If the energy source for the burning machine is changed to renewables, the American way of life as it's implemented would become sustainable, right? It won't be it's because it's not causing climate change. So this is why the focus is on the burning machine. And so the IPCC's framing is designed to do that, to make us look at just the burning machine. And if you look at the way IPCC frames uh, climate change, they start with the base year of 1750. And so, and you know, here is this complicated diagram that they uh, put out in the um, AR5 uh, to talk about the carbon cycle. So you have all these arrows, the black arrows are what nature had already done in 1750. That's what was, we found in 1750. And then the red arrows are what we added as human beings. And so, but there is a combination of annual fluxes here. So this is the annual flux. And, and the total is also shown here at the bottom. This is the total. So I'm gonna split this up and give you two separate diagrams, okay? The problem with the IPCC's framing is that it, it's framing human impact on Earth as if it began in 1750. Until 1750, it said there was no impact. I mean, human beings, our impact was minimal, so ignore it. But that's not true. The second problem with IPCC's framing is it ignores mismatches in the annual short cycle carbon. And I'll show you how, why that cannot be ignored. I mean, as an engineer, I mean, I rebel at that, you know, when uh, I see ign um, uh, certain cycles that are being ignored, we pretend that it's completely balanced or fully balanced. And finally, ignoring Bill Rediman's earlier Anthropocene hypothesis, um, which is actually the foundation of what we are doing. So if you look at the cumulative flux of carbon since 1750, so land has uh, about 2,500 gigatons of carbon. Um, in, and in addition, there is 1,700 gigatons of carbon in permafrost on land. So permafrost is permanently frozen um, land. So that used to be forest that over 3 million years ago, it was forest there. And since then it's gone through ice ages and it's basically um, sequestered as carbon on land. So that's an additional 1,700 gigatons of carbon. And then the estimate is that fossil fuels, we have about 1,471 gigatons of carbon. And the ocean has 40,000 gigatons of carbon, 40,453 gigatons of carbon. So it's huge. It's a huge store of carbon in, there, in the ocean. Now, the atmosphere in 1750 had 589 gigatons of carbon. So between 1750 and today, we have taken 365 gigatons of carbon from the fossil carbon store and we have burnt it up. Okay, so that's gone up there. And we have taken 164 gigatons of carbon from land and deforested it. So that has gone up into the atmosphere. But land has this um, amazing capability of healing itself. So even though we have pumped all this uh, carbon from land into the atmosphere, because the atmospheric carbon increased, then the remaining forests on land start storing more carbon. Okay, so of the 164 gigatons of carbon that we have pumped into the atmosphere from land, 134 gigatons have come back on land. And this is just by adding more carbon to existing forests. So the net effect on land was just a reduction of 30 gigatons over since 1750. Now of the carbon that we added to the atmosphere, 155 gigatons and came back into the ocean. It's come back into the ocean, it's acidified the ocean some more, and some of it has gone into deep sea sediments. 
So only 240 gigatons is remaining in the atmosphere out of the 529 gigatons that we have pumped up. That's about 40%. So 40% has stayed in the atmosphere and 60% has come back down on land and in the ocean. Okay, so this is the cumulative flux. This is the total of what has happened. Now let me look at, let me show you the annual flux. So every year we are taking an additional 7.8 gigatons of fossil carbon and we are burning it and sending it up. So that's this red arrow. And that is the burning machine. Okay, we are adding 7.8 gigatons every year into the atmosphere. And then the killing machine, the killing machine is part of the carbon cycle on land. Okay. So I so it's something that we have we have sort of added to the uh, carbon cycle. And the annual carbon cycle, you notice, is taking uh, 198 gigatons of carbon and pumping it up every year. Okay. And 203 gigatons is coming down every year. So this is huge cycle. Okay. And on top of that, we, have, we are deforesting about 1.1 gigatons and sending it up. And that's the red arrow here. Okay, that's this red arrow, 1.1 gigatons. So what the IPCC does in its modeling is it only counts this 7.8 and this 1.1, 8.9, and it completely ignores the, these 203 and 198 gigatons. Because it claims that that is part of the natural carbon cycle and it's in balance. Now, you know, as an engineer, if I'm building a circuit that's using say one volt, I'm transmitting one volt on a piece on a wire, and, and I know that 30 times as much, that's 198 is about 30 times as much as the 7.8 gigatons. So there's 30 times as much of uh, additional voltage is showing up on my wire and, and I'm asked to pretend that that 30 times as much is, is actually in balance because there is another negative 30 tons coming up on the wire. I want to know, is there any imbalance in that? In fact, it happens to us. When we are transmitting uh, data on, um, on wires, we know that the, our wire is gonna pick up voltages from neighboring FM stations because the wire is a long antenna. So it'll pick up voltages from neighboring uh, FM radio stations. And so this is why we have differential wiring so that you get both positive and negative. And then we twist the wires so that they cancel each other, try to cancel each other. But we don't assume that they perfectly cancel each other, never. I mean, we specify how much cancellation are we expecting. So we have to then design our circuit for the specified mismatch. But the IPCC is assuming that there is a perfect balancing of this annual carbon flux. And every bone in my body rebels at that. Because nothing is perfect, okay? You have to know what is the mismatch in that. And we have evidence that there is mismatch in that. In fact, uh, this, this is why the airborne fraction is 45%. Only four gigatons stays up there. And there is, you know, this, these red numbers are what we are causing through human activities. And this, these numbers are being ignored in the IPCC's modeling. So that is the second problem with the IPCC's framing. And in the scientific method, you know, the way we do science, we formulate a hypothesis. And this, in fact, these three steps, are everything you need to know about how science is done. We formulate a hypothesis 
And then the second step, you devise experiments that test the hypothesis against reality. And then we evaluate. And if the reality does not match expectations in any such experiment, then the hypothesis is wrong. In that one sentence is the entire essence of science. Now, if you find that uh, in your evaluation, the hypothesis is wrong and you continue to use it, you're not being scientific. And so when the IPCC ignores science that's, that is inconvenient, especially like the airborne fraction, you know, they claim that the airborne if the hypothesis is the airborne fraction is caused by accumulated decay of prior CO2 emissions and not by mismatches in annual short cycle carbon, then the airborne fraction should increase as the rate of CO2 emissions increases. And if the airborne fraction decreases as the rate of CO2 emissions increases, then the hypothesis is wrong. And we see that in the evaluation. We see that as the CO2 rate increased since the year 2000, the airborne fraction decreased. Which means that the hypothesis is wrong and there is a mismatch in the short cycle carbon and that has to be taken into account. And that's not being done. That's not being done because then we have to look at the killing machine as one of the major causes of climate change. Okay. So now let me talk about Rediman's hypothesis. Rediman's hypothesis, so again, he is a very, he's a very scientific man. And so he has, he has this hypothesis that uh, human beings started changing climate way back thousands of years ago, not just since 1750. That's his hypothesis. It's called the early Anthropocene hypothesis. He made this hypothesis in 2003, and he has been testing it since then. And every test it has passed. So even though it has passed every test, the IPCC is still ignoring it. So his hypothesis is based on the observation that the current interglacial period looks exactly like what happened three interglacial periods ago. Okay, so it has roughly the same peak and it had, had the same dip initially. And then something happened and that something is human beings and what we did. And what we did was basically we, we deforested land and we burnt coal, oil, and gas, and we basically pumped up the CO2 into the, in, in the atmosphere. And currently, of course, we are, most of all the CO2 that we're emitting comes from fossil fuels, and then there is some from land, okay, the way the IPCC is calculating. But even the IPCC knows that in 1850, land use was the leading cause of anthropogenic emissions. So land use was causing almost all of our CO2 emissions in 1850. But we really didn't start um, you know, doing deforestation in 1850. We started doing deforestation thousands of years ago. So if you now look at the cumulative uh, CO2 emissions, you see that land use is now, is currently number two starting from 1850, it's number two, second only to coal. It's greater than oil and gas. But then if you start integrating from 6,000, I mean, 10,000 years ago, land use is greater than coal, oil, and gas put together. And that is Rudiman's observation. So he showed in his book, um, Plows, Plagues, and Petroleum in 2014, he showed that the methane and the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere was matching what was happening three interglacial periods ago until about 6,000 years ago, and you see the human effect. It deviates. It deviates, and this is because, of, because we started doing agriculture and deforestation. And as a result of that, we kept the temperature constant for 10,000 years, okay? 
we kept the temperature constant. And instead of going back to another ice age, we kept it above the ice age. And then in the last 200 years, we increased the temperature by another one degree Celsius. That's B. So B is about one degree Celsius. A is greater than one degree Celsius. And so this is caused by all of the deforestation that we did prior to 1750. Okay, so this is uh, mainly from animal agriculture and land use change. Now this has land use change component in it and fossil fuel component in it, B. Now Rediman was projecting that if we'll continue doing this and therefore we'll increase the temperature to this, you know, four or five degrees Celsius and then we'll all die off and then we'll, and then the earth will recover back and go back to another ice age. That's his projection. I'm saying, no, we now know that if, we, if you bring back the forest that we destroyed in the previous 8,000 years, we can literally reverse climate change, okay? So I'm saying we can actually do this instead and then bring it back to the thermostat setting if we can create a vegan world. And we can do this because A is greater than B. So all the fossil fuels that we have put into the atmosphere will still be up in the atmosphere. Uh, and, but then in order for us to bring the temperature down, we have to do the opposite of what we are doing today. Instead of a killing machine, we need to have a caring machine. So we need to start caring about all life and bringing them back. So his estimate was that we, were, we deforested and had sent 300 gigatons of carbon into the atmosphere prior to 1750. So that the total from land use change was 464 gigatons, which is greater than 365 gigatons that we have put from fossil fuels. Okay, so total is greater than fossil fuels. But that 300 gigatons actually came back to land um, and it's now stored as peat moss in the Arctic. So every test of the hypothesis, of Rudiman's hypothesis has passed. And this has, so this hypothesis has stood firm for the last 17 years and still the IPCC does not consider this. Now let me look into some of the, show some of the scientific data underlying this. Uh, we know from the distribution of carbon on land that wherever human settlements were maximum is where the, there is the least amount of carbon on land, okay? Carbon is maximized where there are forests on land. And the global carbon stock is inversely proportional to the distribution of animals. So if you look at the animal agriculture footprint, it's inversely correlated with the global carbon stock distribution. So wherever there are animals, you have least amount of carbon. And that's because every year for our pastures, we set fires. We set fires every year so that nothing grows on that land that cannot be eaten by cows. So if cows have, have not eaten something, this, we assume that cows will never eat that and therefore we burn that down. So that, the, so that the only thing that is allowed to grow is what cows eat, okay? But by doing that, we are minimizing, we are reducing the amount of carbon stored on land. So when someone talks about regenerative agriculture, all they're saying is, okay, okay, uh, you know, you guys are com complaining about carbon, so we won't set fires anymore. Okay, and so that any, nothing, other vegetation can grow. Well, when other vegetation grows, that's vegetation that cows don't eat. So that will then start crowding out the vegetation that cows eat. And so very soon the cows will want more land to graze the same amount of food. Right? So when we do regenerative agriculture, we are basically saying, all right, we won't burn. So let the, let the vegetation come back, but we'll use more land to raise the same number of cows. Well, where is that extra land coming from? That extra land will come from forests. And is that the kind of 
um, trade-off we want to do today to cut down more forests to raise the same number of animals. So that's why the regenerative uh, animal farming is the absolute worst thing we can do today. On land that's being used for grazing animals, which is, constitutes 37% of the total land area of the planet, we are only storing 2% of the carbon on land. Okay, so the density of carbon on grazing land is 6% of the density of carbon throughout land, on all land. But this is good news, which means if this animal grazing land is brought back and returned back to forests, we can change this 20% to, I mean, this 2% to 20%, and that would reverse climate change completely. Now, I also want to tie up some loose ends from last, mo um, from last month's um, thing. I showed last month you know, that there are uh, varying, I mean, very different CO2 responses from different models, and that the IPCC is just basically taking the average of all of them and so claiming that that's the consensus. And the difference, I mean, for different um, CO2 responses, you will get different global warming potentials for CO2. And the global warming potential for CO2 is important because it, it is in the new denominator of the global warming potential for methane or nitrous oxide or any of the other greenhouse gases, okay? So it's in the denominator, which means that if the global warming potential is um, overestimated, you are literally underestimating the impact of methane, okay? So by doing this, we are overestimating. If you're assuming that this is the global CO2 response, you'll be overestimating the GWP for CO2. If this one, then, then it will be lower, okay? So I'm just going to give you a numerical example. So here's what I did. Um, I showed you last time that um, the IPCC is using a sum of exponential models, exponentials model, and that in reality, it will be a product of exponentials. So I took this sum of exponentials model and in the product of exponentials, I said, okay, if you put CO2 into the atmosphere, first it'll go and dissolve in the ocean. And then both the ocean and the atmosphere is going to supply to the vegetation and then to the deep sea. So this is the product of exponentials model that, um, that uh, models the CO2 addition to the atmosphere as if it was water in a bunch of cylinders. So there is a very broad pipe between these two cylinders. So therefore this leveling happens first and then these two level up with the vegetation and then so on, right? So that's the product of exponentials model. Now for a given sum of exponentials model, you can come up with the equivalent product of exponentials model. So for this AR4 sum of exponentials model, uh, you can take these numbers 0 0.217, 0 0.259, 0 0.338, 0 0.186, and put them up here as the surface area of these cylinders, and then compute the equivalent product of exponentials model. So, which means these two will level up first, and that will be according to this exponential function. And then these two will level up with the third one according to this exponential function, okay? And these numbers are computed by looking at 0.338 as a ratio of 0.338 versus the sum of these two. So this will be 0 0.39, 0 0.403, right? The sum of these two. And the finally it's 0.259 versus the sum of these three, okay? So then uh, the GWP of 10 of CO2 will go from 0.757 to 0.535. So you can see that instead of dividing by 0.757 for computing the global warming potential of methane, you'll be dividing by 0.535, okay? So you can see how much it will impact the global warming potential of methane if we use the different model. So this is why I say we have to be very careful and we have to question the IPCC as to how it is computing these um, GWPs whether it's a 10-year GWP or 20-year GWP or a 100-year GWP, the model has a huge impact. The CO2 model has a huge impact on the denominator. Anyway, thank you very much. 
and I'll uh, stop sharing and open it up for questions. Good morning, Dr. Dr. Rao. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Hi. I, I've been wondering this, like who else nowadays support this incredible explanation that you have given us? Like I'm talking about who other uh, individual, scientist, institution, university, support group, like who is out there that, that uh, can be an ally to get the word out about this? Uh, it's a very good question. I'm look, I have been searching for someone like that. <laughs> uh, and unfortunately, you know, I've been doing the research myself for the last 12 or 13 years. And um, once people find out that this is what I'm doing, they stop talking to me. So because they know that I'm sort of questioning the um, mainstream narrative, right? So it's been difficult that way to get, um, because this is a, we have to go through a mass delusion, you know, in order to go from an implement, a specification to an implementation that's the exact opposite of the specification. It, there has to be a mass delusion happening and it has to be very systematic, um, uh, I guess, misdirection of, of people from reality, okay? So, someone who is trying to look at reality as is, and someone who is trying to understand the science as it should be understood, becomes a threat to the system. And so you see them, you know, you see scientists all coming together and trying to pretend I'm not there. But uh, I have to tell you that on Monday, I'm going to talk to climate scientists at Jet Propulsion Laboratories and I'm going to be showing some of these, um, these alternate explanations and um, including Rudiman's hypothesis. They all know Rudiman's hypothesis, okay? They, because Rudiman has been talking about this for years, uh, but they listen to him. They say, aha, you know, good, good. And then they go off and write their own thing. Dr. Rao. Much, much success for Monday, Dr. Rao. Yeah, and you. hope we can see a video on how that goes or hear about it from you in another opportunity. Thank you so much. Yeah, it's a closed uh, meeting, so it's not uh, open to anyone else. Yeah. Dr. Rao, I'd just like to say that, you know, this morning I saw something that Rebecca shared about a huge, um, huge dairy operation and I thought is this photoshopped it's like just massive cages or massive lines of these cages for the little calves mm -hmm. and I'm like what the heck and you know so it is it struck me that we're now perhaps leaving the age of information and we and we have to now take that information that we are really saturated in if we just open our eyes mm -hmm. and move into an age of reconciliation. And people have to be brave, like you are, to say, uh, you know, we have to actually challenge the status quo, the narrative, the propaganda machine, and it's a matter of survival. So whether it's glyphosate or industrial animal agriculture, or I would, I'm always saying, look at lawyers committee for 9-11 truth. You know, these are difficult truths or at least information that we have to be brave enough to say, let's talk about it. Let's yeah. put it on the table. You can't just say these things aren't happening or, pretend they're going to go away. Thank you. Thank you, yeah. I mean, we all have to become Columbus, you know? Uh, <laughs> looking at things that don't match, you know, tie up loose ends, <laughs> you know, 
and then you'll start asking questions as to why does this not match what you said? <laughs> you said you said Columbo, right? I heard yeah, Columbus yeah. at first. We no, got to no, stop no. being Columbus and start being Columbo. Gotcha. Right <laughs> there, you go. <laughs> uh, Silesh, um, can you hear me? Yes, Carol. Okay. Um, are you working with anyone uh, to make this presentation understandable to Greta Thunberg? Um, someone of her influential nature who would speak very simply to the world. Yeah, um, we are actually trying to get it in a form that Kimaya can say it. So that's, uh, um, Ray is working on scripting this. So it becomes something that Kimaya can say it. Uh, Greta Thunberg, yeah, people have been sending her links to my videos, and um, but I think so far she's it's been filtered out before it gets to her. That's a great idea, though, too, because we're we're scripting it, but we didn't specifically address it to Greta. What a great idea! Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, that's a great idea. Actually, in the script, Kimaya talking to Greta. <laughs> Leave the leave the grown ups out of the conversation. They've proven that uh, they're they're not <laughs> listening. So, <laughs> straight channel. I've got a question about the uh, you mentioned with the airborne fraction that uh, if right. the hypothesis is wrong, stop mm -hmm. using it. Right. <laughs> this is science. It's it's wrong now. It was right. right. It was fine when you when it was when everybody agreed upon it. But now that we recognize that there's a problem, we have to stop using it. And this is, you know, has to apply to the vegan community, the activist community who say that the prevailing science is 15, 14 and a half percent of animal of emissions are attributed to, to uh, animal agriculture. This is not the case. I mean, it, it was never good science to begin with, but there was something that they, they decided was, was uh, workable science. And since then the IPCC says, Look, you've got you to calculate the methane right. If it's a, you have to use the right global warming potential to calculate the true effect of methane. Otherwise, it's, it's wrong. No, not <laughs> wrong. <laughs> so we're quoting wrong statistics exactly. repeatedly over and over again. If you watch, um, I mean, James Cameron, really smart guy, a vegan, an environmentalist. He's quoting in, in uh, Game Changers that animal agriculture is about 15%. Right. This is like uh, 13 years out of date. And the IPCC says you use a global warming potential that's appropriate. This is using a global warming potential that, that uh, you know, reduces carbon, uh, or, sorry, uh, methane impacts as much as it possibly can. Right. And our, all of our crisis is right before us. This next decade is so important to, of what we do, yet we're, we're calculating the impact of, of carbon dioxide 100 years from now. We want to know what's happening this decade. What can we do this decade? So we need to, to calculate our impact on this decade and stop this nonsense of, of uh, you know, the, the uh, IPCC 5 came out in 2014. Nobody's recalculated it. We're fine with these wrong numbers. Right. So um, stop using those numbers, right? Yeah. I think every time someone, some vegan organization uses that number, we need to have a team that goes and sends them letters saying, don't use that number. You know, um, we can't let them get away with this. I've so, been encouraging people to, to uh, switch it around. Talk about solutions because by far, Food solutions provide uh, an avenue to create the, uh, the most change in our emissions, and it's something that we don't need government approval to do. We just, you know, create the, right. empower the vegan movement, move uh, all forms of shifting to plant-based diets, and this is something yeah. that, uh, you know, we do with, we don't need to wait for permission. All the people, all the environmentalists who are so frustrated that the government's not listening, this is an avenue you can make change without you know, getting the stamp of approval from Donald Trump. You're here, Ray. This is Joyce. Can you hear me? Yes, Joyce. Okay. That is what I have been trying to put out there and which is so frustrating is we don't need to pass legislation. 
We don't need to push the fossil fuel companies. I mean, that's all fine, but what the next meal you eat is what saves or destroys the planet. That's it. That's it. It's simple, right? It's hard to get it across and it's hard to get it implemented. But so I have a couple questions. So I'm a little confused on the Rudiman uh, study. Mm -hmm. it, are you in? 100% agreement with it or are there things that you don't agree with? I agree so with I it 100% because he is basically he's a, he's a very systematic scientist who has uh, who proposed the hypothesis in 2003 and he has been testing it ever since and every test it has met so far. So this is why I say his hypothesis should be considered a theory by now. Mm -hmm. you know, how many times should you have to test it before you say it's valid? I see. But okay. they still don't use that. They start from 1750 and they pretend that, you know, it is nature that kept the temperature constant for 10,000 years. It wasn't nature, it's human okay. beings. Yeah. So, so if I get his book and read it, uh, right now you're in agreement with his theory. Absolutely, yeah. Okay. And the, my other thing is that um, I saw an interview with James Hansen mm -hmm. that was so frustrating to me. And um, just, it was, it was a recent interview on, uh, I think it was the Truth About Health series. I don't know if you, it's, so those are all mostly vegan doctors and or whole food mm -hmm. plant-based doctors. Anyway, they, but they have other people on there. And so in this short little interview after his talk, they ask him about, you know, what effect would it be for people to go vegan? And he, <laughs> he poo-pooed it. He said, you know, that's fine for the individual, but it doesn't make the big difference. Now, I'm wondering if you've ever ha talked to him or yeah. he must be aware of your paper, right? I mean, what's going on? Well, he, I, I mean, I'll send him a copy of me. I haven't sent it to him yet. I'll send him a copy of my paper. I have talked to him in the past and um, he flat out said, I cannot give up my beef. Uh -huh. I cannot give up my barbecue. So basically he's now in the, you know, American way of life is non-negotiable. Right. Uh, oh, what a, it's a crime. And, but he has so much, um, you know, people listen to him so much. In fact, I had a, on my flyer that I hand out everywhere and take with me everywhere, I quoted him because I found a video one time where he said, uh, but he was talking to some vegan group and he said, uh, you know, go veg, save the planet, but I'm going to have to change my flyer now because, uh, you know. No, well, he has said that. He has said, that. see, he, I think he understands, he knows. I mean, he knows that you know, the land carbon is distributed the way it is distributed. He knows that grazing land only stores 2% of the carbon. You know, he knows that if you bring back the forests on that land, you can reverse climate change. You can sequester all that extra carbon. This is not complicated science. This is very simple stuff that he, mm -hmm. he should be able, he understands. He yes, just doesn't the, believe it can be done. This is why he keeps talking about, you know, uh, top-down solutions. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, that fits into what I was saying before about uh, about you know those frustrated environmentalists who aren't getting their their policy change. Maybe policy isn't the answer, but policy is ultimately going to be there. Right. When the population says we want a vegan world, they'll have to give us a vegan world. Right. But obviously, we can't ask for a vegan world now, so we have to change our society first. Right. The reason why environmentalists keep hearing no is because there's apathy out there. Nobody cares. You have to get the people to change first. So it doesn't matter how many people show up with signs on the doorstep of in Washington. You know, if people care, even when they're sitting at home, when they vote, when they, you know, when they read their newspaper, when they choose their newspaper to read, when they decide that newspapers are, are um, they look at the uh, influence that, of the people that own the newspapers and realize that you're not getting the truth from them. Find your, find your truths. This is all important stuff that we need to, to do as citizens. Mm -hmm. And I mentioned voting, voting is important, but if you vote and then sit back and go, Oh, well, it's all in the hands of the politicians. We're done. We, we, 
really need people movements. Right. Jorge, you had a question? Yes, thank you, Dr. Rao. Uh, I think I, I have stumbled into a natural ally of your hypothesis. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna put the quote here. I, I, I read it on a media that is uh, becoming popular. It's called Sentient Media. And, and the person's name of this article is Nicholas Carter. Oh, yes, I know him. Oh, yes? Okay. I, mean, I, so I, I, I just got to know of him through another contact. I'm talking to them tomorrow. <laughs> really? <laughs> yes. Wow. Okay, excellent. <laughs> Thank you. So, yeah, you're very close in, in, in your results. I don't know right. if you got to the numbers in the same methodology. Right. But it's cool okay. that you're going to, yeah, because I, I believe that it's a question of showing up in numbers, you know? Right. Yeah. So if, if we're a few, we need to be a few together. Yeah. Yeah. I'm talking to them tomorrow. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> Somebody that I've uh, mentioned it to is Catherine Hayhoe. She was uh, doing a, some sort of live presentation and I brought up the early Anthropocene hypothesis and she uh, seemed to acknowledge it, and she referred to him as, as Bill Rudiman. So they're on a first name basis. <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> Carla, you had a question? Hi, yes, <clears throat> I do, thank you. So one of the things that I struggle with is how to help people understand, and maybe you all have a way to answer this. I have managed to show people some of this science, and they are saying, okay, we're not gonna eat ruminant animals. We're not gonna eat cows or anything from a cow or sheep. Um, but then what happens if they just eat more chicken and more fish and more um, pig? So how do we, what's the answer to that? Because we're talking about carbon and grazing and methane. Right. Does that? Yeah, we are looking at uh, just climate change as the major problem, but there is biodiversity loss, there is ecosystems collapse. When you look at all of them, we cannot be a predator species anymore, mm -hmm. okay? Uh, if they're just looking at our own numbers, number of human beings that are on the planet, we cannot be a predator species anymore. So there is a, um, the Global Footprint Network has done an analysis and they have showed that at American rates of consumption, the planet can only support 1 billion people mm -hmm. sustainably. At European rates of consumption is 2 billion people. Okay, so it's, so that basically says that if we continue to be a predator species, we are expecting 7 billion people that die off. Mm -hmm. okay, so, and we think it shouldn't be Americans, it should be others, right? So uh, uh, is this how we are solving our problem? You know, and when people die off, are they gonna stay there? Or are they gonna come over to our borders? And when right. they come to our borders, are we gonna put them in cages? Is that what's going, is that our plan? Mm -hmm. That's been our plan so far. And I'm saying that is un-American. Right. That's not what I signed up for, you know? So that's completely un-American. And so I, uh, I want to see us trying to implement what we said we were going to implement. Mm -hmm. This is what Dr. King was talking about when he said, I have a dream. That's the dream. Mm -hmm. I am all for that dream. Mm -hmm. Not for the current implementation of that dream. Right. So it sounds to me then, even if some of the animal products that are produced in animal agriculture are not as devastating for specifically climate change, that doesn't mean that's still the way to, to go. It doesn't right. mean over there. There's right. other damage that's being done. Right. right? Yeah. Okay. It and comes down to our attitude. Right. Right. Our attitude is, uh, if our attitude is only about exploitation, how can right. I exploit? Then mm -hmm. Uh, why exploit just these? You know, you can exploit cows, you can exploit mm -hmm. buffaloes, and you can exploit bears, you know, do whatever you want. Mm -hmm. I mean, it is the attitude of the, the vegan movement that a lot of people uh, discredit and are really opaque to. They don't really understand it as anything other than what I'm going to have to suffer. I'm going to have to, you know, live a, mm -hmm. a lifestyle of, of less options. Whereas the vegan movement itself has so much to offer, including that openness to these solutions. Right. Yeah, so exactly. many things are obvious to, to vegan activists that aren't mm -hmm. obvious to the average uh, environmental activist 
or the average social justice activist. Once you, you are living in this state of analyzing oppression and realizing all of it's got to be solved, uh, things like we were talking about the, the American dream. Why is it the American dream? Why isn't it it's something that can be shared with the world? Yeah, Obviously, yeah. that we can't in, uh, introduce oppression to other parts of the world to maintain this this American lifestyle that uh, George H. W. Bush was, says is non-negotiable. Mm -hmm. right. uh, yeah, there's, yeah. It's recognizing yeah. that there's a convergence of all these different movements right now. There's the like, people are becoming ethical. Yeah. Environmentalists yeah. don't just discredit that and go, "Oh yeah, well that's you know uh, heartstrings music over there." It's really happening. And mm -hmm. there's this convergence of, of ethics and science and nutrition. Mm -hmm. See John McDougall on that has joined right. the call. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Has he? <laughs> uh, yeah. So thank you for that. And it's, you know, climate change, we have hard data and science, everything else around ethics and non-oppression and non-violence is, you know, it's a little bit more ethereal. So, you know, but it is growing and we're going to reach critical mass. Well, the other thing I'd like to add is uh, let's not forget what's happening right now with pandemic coronavirus. Yeah, yes. And and you said, well, people say, well, I'll go to chicken and turkey. Well, mm -hmm. these are often bird type flus as well. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if we could reach the the poor people, the or I'm not going to say poor, the, the challenged people that are the frontline health workers, Mm -hmm. um, and saying, and you know, people who are stewardesses and, and stewards and pilots and, and such uh, who are in transportation with large crowds of people. And now they're very fearful because their job requires them to go on the front line with in, into the pandemic. So we need to say, well, why are we here? It's because of industrial animal agriculture being a breeding ground. How many of you have seen Dr. Greger's recent uh, production about pandemic? It's excellent. BJ, you had a question? Well, first I want to show you uh, for Carol and everybody, I have a new thing oh, good. I'm working on. Good. And I will be posting that in um, Basecamp. So if you're not familiar with Basecamp, I'll get a review and then it'll be out there and see what you think. The question I had uh, was about the chart. I'm still learning about the, the carbon charts. And in the actual carbon chart, at one point you said 400 gigatons, but there wasn't a 400 on there. So you must have added some things together. Oh, uh, hold on a second. Let me start yeah, sharing it that. and you can see. Thank you. Uh. Do you see my presentation? Yes. For some reason, it's showing me an hourglass. Hold on. Okay, yeah, I see, I see it, it's on the heading. Okay. Yeah. I think it's PowerPoint has gone crazy. Okay. Well, it may be what I will do is, um, is watch it again on YouTube and, and study it a little bit and then maybe I can post a question. Will that work? Okay, yeah, okay. sure. And then my friend has a question. Uh, sure. I wondered if you could explain to me, um, in layman terms, how the ocean sequesters carbon. Okay, so the ocean also has vegetation. Um, ocean has a lot of, um, I mean, ocean also goes through photosynthesis. It, you know, 
sequester CO2 by growing plants. And then the plants are eaten by animals. And so there's a whole ecosystem in the ocean. In addition, the ocean uh, dissolves CO2. So CO2 mixes with water and becomes carbonic acid, right? So this is how the ocean uh, has a certain pH level and it, it increases the pH level. It becomes more acidic, it decreases the pH level, becomes more acidic when, um, uh, when there is more CO2 in the atmosphere. And then over time, the, uh, there is deep sea sediments that also take up the CO2. So the ocean has a lot more CO2 than, um, than land. It actually has about 20 times as much carbon as land. Because, and most of it is stored in deep sea sediments. So you can imagine that to be you know, like the soil on land, right? So there it is in the ocean. It just goes uh, and, and gets buried deep under, under the water and it just doesn't come back after that. Um, hey, this is Joyce. Yes, Joyce. And, um, so a couple things. Um, just wondering if your granddaughter's school, have you had any luck in getting them to serve vegan meals? Oh, um, the, as I told you, the, I mean, I don't know if I said this, but my granddaughter's uh, school, the, the founder and uh, the Honda and their family went vegan. Oh, wow. Once they watched What the Health. Oh, and since then, they have been one of the strongest proponents of veganism in the school. So uh, every occasion, they have a vegan section. Um, they haven't made everything vegan, but they have, they have a vegan section at every, in every occasion. Awesome. Yeah. So, okay, so I understand you're coming out to the Bay Area, correct? San Francisco Bay Area soon-ish? Um, in April, yeah. April, oh, April. Okay. So do you have your, your dates yet? Um, it's being worked out. I, I have okay. to be there sometime between 19th and the 25th. Okay. So do you have any, uh, will you be speaking at any of the local colleges? Uh, are you set up for that? If not, I want to see, I know you have somebody who's facilitating, um, speaking times for you. So Stanford, San Jose State, De Anza, Foothill, West Valley, uh, Santa Clara. Let's, I want to get you at all of those if possible. Thank you. Yes, I would love to speak to all of them. Okay, but right now you don't have any. Do you have any connections to, to um, professors who teach? Um, I have connections to professors in engineering and so, but they're not of much use when I'm talking about the environment, you know, so. Um. Joyce, can Benjamin and I connect with you offline about Dr. Rao's speaking engagements? I think she went silent a bit. Well, we'll I'll follow up with you to connect. Okay. With you. Okay. Hi, Dr. Rao. Yes. Uh, I just wanted to know uh, the, the net carbon which comes out from the and on an annual basis from animal agriculture compared to fossil fuels, because uh, I think in one of the right. graphs you had read the numbers, but it wasn't very clear the net carbon, annual net carbon uh, from animal agriculture versus fossil fuels. That I think that's one most important thing. Yeah, that's actually uh, section five, and I'm going to go through that in section five. In, yeah, no, section four, next section. I'm going to go through that in detail, the next section. The global sensitivity analysis. Yeah. I, I hope this isn't too nerdy a question, but I want to ask about the Milankovitch cycles that, that this orange right. line right. Uh, right. predicts the the uh, climate fairly accurately. And is it is that something that 
scientists have have accepted as more or less fact by this point and the language cycles yeah yeah and the fascinating thing about it is that in the holocene period as soon as we learned agriculture it flatlines we we've, we've right. actually moderate moderated the the climate with human actions unwittingly which i right. find fascinating right. but uh does anybody challenge that that section that agriculture is has influenced that that leveling effect well that was those are the challenges that uh, rudiman has been addressing one by one is so there a lot of been, resistance to it or is there everybody yeah, like yeah. okay well that makes sense no no people have been uh, people have been giving him counter examples to show that his theory is wrong and he has always gone and um and addressed each one of them so if you look at his uh uh agu um plenary address he did a keynote speech at the agu in 2013 he he goes through um all objections that were made to his theory i mean his hypothesis and how each one of them got overturned over time do proponents from the agriculture industry reject it and you know flood the flood the uh, science with a bunch of contrary information or are they just not paying attention to that at all to his theory his hypothesis um i don't know if they even know about it <laughs> so uh, you know the thing is we are a part of nature so we keep saying that you know holocene is natural and then anthropocene is human right as if uh, we are not part of nature so this is why they're trying to date the anthropocene as starting in the 1950s and uh, the early anth uh, anthropocene hypothesis basically says no holocene has been entirely anthropocene basically there is no distinction between the two right and this is the reason why holocene has this remarkably constant temperatures uh, whereas you never see that in the ice core record in every other interglacial period you never see anything as remarkable as this i found a, an image of it can i share my screen for a second so we can show what we're talking about Can we see it? Yeah. So you can see that area at the end there. It, everything up for the last uh, eight hundred thousand years is up and down, up and down, up and down, and there isn't any anything that's level. And then all of a sudden, agriculture and it's you know a line right across. Well, uh, you have to be careful with that graph because um, the the you know the there are two different uh, scales there. the scale at the end is a very is an is an amplified scale scale before that is in 1000 years right so it's 100000 200000 etc to 800000 and the last one is just you know or it's one unit has been expanded to it to 1000 well we're looking at the the black lines there right would be the yeah 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 what I'm pointing out is that this uh, can you see my pointer at all No okay okay anyway so the scales are different at the end okay so the scale is different at the end so this one's stretching it out right uh, it's stretched out yeah uh, uh, partially to to illustrate that over the 800,000 years that it is flat towards the end so that would be a lot a lot more compressed but it is uh undeniably more stability than we've seen in any of this 800,000 years. Well, it's more, it's more stable than what what happened 3 interglacial periods ago, which was pretty close to what is happening today. So it's this one. Yeah. Uh Silas, I've yes. been watching some YouTube videos by Vandana Shiva recently. uh she is a person who is probably on board with what you're doing uh having uh, been motivated by the loss of 300,000 indian farmers to suicide mm -hmm. and uh, due to monsanto chemicals and so on and artificial fertilizers and she's very uh, doing the seed saving and so that uh, they can step outside of the control of those companies but she's also a uh, physicist and she would understand what you present 
Mm -hmm. uh, and she's also an, an incredible influencer. Wherever she goes, she receives a standing ovation before she speaks and after. So um, uh, in, in addition to Greta, who's appealing to many of the youngest of the um, climate um, people who are aware, activists, and those who are uh, beginning to protest, she has been uh, verbally and quietly and effectively protesting with her talks. And I, do you have any kind of connection to her? Well, I have her email address and I have, I have met her, uh, but she's, she still thinks that cows are an integral part of agriculture. So she, she still consumes dairy. She's, um, and she's a strong proponent of dairy consumption. And she thinks that she can raise cows sustainably. So we have a difference of opinion, not a difference, just of opinion, of, of scientific fact. <laughs> Is she aware of your facts, the, what you've put together though? Um, well, uh, to be, you know, um, I didn't put it all down until October of this, of last year. So it's, it's just three months old, okay, four months old. So I haven't had much time to do any um, propagation of this idea. And this is part of this. I'm just trying to explain it to people first and put it all out in videos. And then I'll start contacting people. And in fact, uh, in response to Sai's question, uh, the Ecological Society Journal is looking at publishing the white paper, mm -hmm. uh, but as a reprint, because they said you already published it on your web page. So I cannot, we cannot publish it as a, as a new paper. It has to be like a reprint. I found a better um, chart than the other one. Can I show it just quickly? Mm -hmm. This shows the Milankovitch cycles, which is the curve. This is the algorithm that's developed from the, you know, it measures the wobble of the earth, the changes of right. the seasons and the amplification of a bunch of different factors. Right. And it plotted against the, the, uh, temperatures of uh, extrapolated from the ice core samples that scientists right. have gathered, it matches up really well. Mm -hmm. And this is all the same scale and it's only the 250,000 years or as opposed to the 800,000 in the previous one. But you can see that that uh, pink line at the end levels out and diverges from what Milankovitch had predicted. Right. So we eliminated an ice age with our agriculture right yeah. I'm saying it <laughs> and uh, Bill Wright have been saying it so ho hopefully this is something that uh, people will pay attention to the, you, you mentioned that the problem is isn't that it's been proven wrong it's been ignored ignoring in science is is a really upsetting thing it's not the scientific process it's not scientific method to go yeah we're not interested in that we're not gonna we're not gonna counter we're not going to calculate we're gonna ignore it that's, yeah. that's not science, that's politics. We have to sort that out. Yeah, why not to try and publish in nature? Well, I approached nature and they didn't want to hear about it. Because <laughs> it's, it's contrary to mainstream framing, okay? Our, our white paper is completely contrary to mainstream framing. Of so the change. challenge is that, that, uh, that last little leveled part of the squiggly line is the, where the controversy is. Is there any controversy with the Milankovitch cycles or is that something that all geologists and, and uh, environmental activists and, and scientists agree upon? They agree upon that. You know, I mean, Milankovitch cycles, uh, they all know that it is caused by a small, uh, like 0.5 watt per square meter change in the amount of radiation coming from the earth. Coming so that's, earth. This is where the new ice age was supposed to start, like 500,000 year, five, 5, years ago. Right, yeah. We see it crossing the line there. Right, yeah. What do, what do they have to say about that? It's just like, hmm, oh well, <laughs> no ice age. Well, they, you know, if you look at the way everyone else, everyone frames it, including Bill McKibben, and I mean, we had this remarkably stable, nature gave us this remarkably stable Holocene, and then we messed it up starting 250 years ago. Right, that's the way it's always framed. 
Nature right. did. It did that by creating human <laughs> beings who decided that they want to do agriculture. Right. We get we get hard on agriculture, but this is this is an incredible uh, thing that nature did was was uh, allow us to do agriculture. We created an environment where agriculture right. was possible. It yeah. was kind of a, this self self fulfilling prophecy in a sense. And then uh, obviously this orange zone is is what the uh, scientists want to focus on. They say this is the whole story here where it does the upshift, upshift which obviously right. is a problem, easy to point at, but right. this is pretty cool, this this uh, yellow area where right. we did that. And, and by doing something really bad, we did something really good unwittingly. Yeah, you know, so I'm now we got to make conscious decisions to do good things. Right. So I'm going to stop recording and then we can continue the conversation for as long as we want.